Welcome to Tim Reptile again and today we've got another build video for you lucky people but what is this? Why am I sat next to a half built build? Surely it should be the beginning of the build and it's bare when I'm doing this or the end when it's full. The truth is we finished the build once we started using the vivarium the water level rose in the drainage layer and we sprung a leak. It was the smallest leak you could imagine that would evaporate quicker than it was leaking out almost. But we just had to do something about it. The moral of this story is if you're going to have a drainage layer or a water feature in your viv or tank, always do a water test before you start. Which if you look just here, we're doing on the next build before. Lesson learnt, we're going to do a water test every time anyway. We've re-siliconed all around the base. It's not the tidiest job, but it's only for the drainage layer and the substrate. So it doesn't really matter. And we're going to get on with it. So check out today's video. Uh, there's a new species at the end for you to see. It's nothing spectacular, but we're really happy. And if you're on a budget, it's probably something you can afford. Um, this build isn't the biggest build, which came with its own challenges. But it's a pretty budget build as well. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please consider liking, subscribing, leave a comment, let us know what you think of this build and the species that we've got, and would very much appreciate it. Thanks YouTube, let's get on with the video. So this build, as usual, has been a bit of a family affair. Layla wanted to get involved in the layout of this one, so we got some little bits of cork bark we had lying around, we got loads of them, and some, I think it's redwood or something it was called from an aquatic shop, just some little branchy type bits. And I think she came up with a layout which was better than what I would have, which is quite annoying. But you can see we've laid it out there and I'm just adding the touch and foam pond safe expanding foam to get everything in place. And this is us just rotating the vivarium after the background has dried somewhat. And because we want to get a little bit of expanding foam on the sides, give it a bit of depth. Uh, make the animals inside feel a little secure, not too open. Uh, so there I am, using absolute brute force to rotate the vivarium. So we can get a bit of foam on the side there. Just getting a bit of extra cork bark in. Using up all these tiny bits that we've accrued. Someone very kindly gave me a big bin bag full of it before. What we found was, it was we were better off spraying the foam and plonking what we wanted on top then placing it on the glass and spraying around it because as the foam would expand it would conceal quite a lot of the wood that we were trying to show. Here we are with the final side that we're going to put a bit on. We're not putting a lot on this side, uh, we don't want to insulate it too much because this might be a side that we want to affix a heat mat to at a later date just to give uh, an ambient temperature somewhere that they can go at night perhaps if it's getting chilled. So we just put a little bit at the bottom here and we make a, a fake ledge. It'll become apparent later how we maintain it to be effective with a heat mat. But there's a little bit there to create a ledge. That's essentially the whole background foamed now. Apart from we need to foam the branches in, which you'll see us doing just here. We just put put them in as we'd wanted and secured the back with foam. Once the foam's cured, it has a shiny, glossy effect, which the silicon that we want to put on next won't adhere to. So here we can see Amy is slowly but surely picking her way at the glossy finish. You don't need to take a lot off, you just need to remove the gloss finish to reveal the bubbles inside. That provides you with a rough surface that your silicon can adhere to. It's not very tricky, but it's a pretty vital part. We picked off most of this with our fingers. Uh, you can use cutting tools, razor blades. People use drill attachments sometimes to remove things. But this is it. Once we've removed all the shiny bit, you can see, you can see the small bubbles everywhere. I think you can see it's a rougher finish, and that's the background ready for the silicon. Our preference is always to use an aquarium safe silicon 
and our chosen colour is normally brown, but we were out of stock of brown, so, but we had black. And we've used black before and it's pretty good. We haven't really had any problems. It's just brown looks more natural if some of the substrate comes off at a later date. So you want to work pretty quickly. This was quite tricky getting the, the corking gun and the tube of silicon in and, in and amongst everything in such a small vivarium. We did it in stages, so we did the back first. You want to move quite quickly because you don't want the silicon to cure without the substrate really getting stuck in there. So here you can see us doing the back. We did it in stages. We did the back. We let the substrate stick to the silicon for a few hours and then we rotated it and we did each side separately. You do want to push that substrate right into the silicon when you're doing this though. So we're moving on to the drainage layer. You can see the background's all affixed now. This is the drainage layer. So when we put the drainage layer in, we want to be able to drain the drainage layer should we need to. So we use a bit of hose. It's like a waste pipe for a washing machine or a dishwasher. We we'll make a load of holes in the base. Then we found hot glue was pretty good for securing it in. So here you can see Amy putting in a pile of hot glue and just affixing the hose with full of holes so the water can flow into there, but hopefully the hydrolecker doesn't block the pipe. And we can get a turkey baster down there. It's the right diameter and remove water as and when required in the future. We've used this design in a couple of builds and it seems to work really well. We can siphon or turkey baste out the water when required. So we need a lid to the pipe to stop the inhabitants getting down there or the cleanup crew getting stuck down there. So all we do is get a bit of a seed pod, get a bit of bamboo, hot glue the two together and pop. Makes a nice little lid that just drops into place. It's not fixed, but it seems to work. And here you can see the background finished with a hydrolecker drainage layer and how we're going to siphon it out. In order to separate the drainage layer from the substrate, we've used weed fabric as you can see here. I think this is from the pound shop. I don't think you need to spend a lot of money, just make sure there's no chemicals involved. So the first bit of our substrate we're going to put in is some charcoal, which has been well seeded with a colony of springtails. The charcoal will provide an environment for the springtails that has a lot of surface area. And it will also provide an environment for good bacteria to live within the substrate. Once we've put that in, spread it out, made sure the springtails get throughout the system as we're adding more substrate. We can consider other members of the cleanup crew, but these are going to be the base of our cleanup crew. And if you have a look, you can see hundreds, if not thousands, crawling around in there. And that's a good start for our bioactive substrate. Now we're using a substrate which closely resembles an ABG mix using tree fern, sphagnum, topsoil, cocoa fibre, peat, sand and leaf litter which should provide a healthy environment for our cleanup crew and the plants. There you can see a Ficus benjamima on the right and we've got a air plant planted in some sphagnum in a pot up on the top left. There's a pilea in the bottom left there which looks great but unfortunately didn't do very well pretty rapidly so we removed it but we'll be replacing it at some point i think it's pilea norfolk but here we can see the cleanup crew going in these guys haven't been eating their food so it's gone a bit furry but here's some powder blue isopods they've done very well in there so we just shake them off the cork bark we've got a good little population to get going in there but i leave enough to make sure there's good breeding stock in the tubs that we maintain but they're going to form a big part of our cleanup crew. I would like to add tropical white isopods, but I seem to struggle to maintain them and obtain them in the first place. But we've got another species of isopod, and these are the giant orange species. I'm not sure on the Latin of either of these species, but there you can see it's teeming with them, so we get a good lot in there. I tend to try to keep the big ones in the breeding tubs, just to make sure that I've got enough to keep going. So I just catch that big one and pop him back in with the others. But there we are, that's our uh, substrate seeded with cleanup crew. We'll hopefully maintain this for us once the inhabitants are added. Ideally, you leave this a few weeks to mature and these guys to grow. But because you haven't got any inhabitants producing waste, you're gonna have to feed these guys something. And you can put leaf extra leaf litter in there you can put perhaps what you gut load your insects with they'll eat 
We tend to put a bit of cuttlefish bone as well because these guys require a lot of calcium to create their exoskeleton. Here you can see it, it's just crawling with life straight away. Fantastic. This is exactly what you want for the health of your animals, your plants and the micro ecosystem you're about to produce. So to keep them happy, this is what we use, Arcadia Custodian Fuel. I do think a lot of these things are gimmicky, but we've used this and I find it's really good. We get good results. The isopods and the springtail seem to thrive on this stuff. So in all my setups, I just put a few sticks in every now and then just to make sure they've got enough food and they're topped up and they have got enough healthy cleanup crew to remove any waste produced by our inhabitants. So trumpet fanfare, here we are with the new inhabitant going in. And we've got an American grey tree frog. We're quite excited to get this guy. We swapped some of our toadlets for him. There he is. I think the markings are fantastic. His actual price was 19 99 in the shop, which I think is very reasonable. He's captive bred and he has some really nice markings actually. I think they're very sort of considered a drab species but I love them and I don't see why something like an Amazon milk frog is considered a lot more desirable should we say than this guy you have to excuse the filming Legler was on camera duty while I was frog wrangling here but yeah you can see the markings on him there and I think it's a great looking frog now to be honest I wasn't really in the market for one of these I was keeping my eye out for a North American green tree frog but we couldn't find any. They were captive bred, and Amy and Layla really liked this guy. I know his care requirements are very similar to the North American American Green Tree Frog, so I thought we had a little viv at home, and we could accommodate him in that. So here's just one final close-up of him. It's the best shot you're going to have in this video of him, I'm afraid, because it wasn't long after this we had to tear out the viv. So that's it for today, folks. Unfortunately, it does end a little abruptly because of the issue and we couldn't get any more footage of the grey tree frog in here he's in a tub now it would make very good viewing so once he's back in i'm sure we'll be posting up some new footage of him along with new additions as you can as you saw earlier we've done a water test on another viv for another build so consider liking and subscribing if you like these quirky species that are not that are not kept by everyone all the time and hopefully there'll be something of interest for you in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. Take care, YouTube.